Good morning and thank you for joining us here at Cincy Lifestyle. It is Wednesday. It is April the 1st and no kidding. We have a great <laughs> show lined up for you, right Mona? That's absolutely true, Clyde. We have a great show. Really a lot, lot of cool things. That's some kitchen remodeling on a budget. That's going to be fun. Hey, you know what, Clyde? I don't know if you remembered to take out Tuesday yesterday, <laughs> but I did and I had a lot of choices and I narrowed it down. It was a difficult choice, mm -hmm. but I narrowed it down to you, right? Bob Evans right there. I did Down Bob the Evans. Farm. It was really good. And the uh, driver came and delivered and oh, he yeah. almost tossed it to me. He was trying to keep that six <laughs> feet of distance, but he was great. And I had some good um, ham steaks from mm. Bob Evans along mm. with some corn mm. and um, some broccoli. It was really good. Oh boy. Yeah, that sounds like a really good, uh, very healthy gut friendly kind of diet, right? <laughs> it was. Yeah. yeah. Well, folks at home know what we mean when we talk about gut friendly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, as you know, we, we always like to give you something to look at and chuckle at. So I'm going to show you something right quick, uh, which is graduation 2020. This is uh, one of those things in which a young man is wearing a set of uh, uh, virtual reality goggles. Sadly for graduates, uh, college and high school, this is going to be uh, a difficult year, but I'm hoping communities will, as funny as this is, will step up and uh, provide some graduation and for high schoolers as well, some prom experiences once things loosen up. So, uh, but there you have it. That Absolutely. is, yeah, that is our reality. It uh, is. You know, while we're talking about all of this uh, being on lockdown, here's a question for you. Does sitting at home give you HGTV fever? Uh, if so, you do you mind yourself looking around or find yourself looking around thinking about updating your home, but not wanting to drop a whole wad of money on a full renovation? Well, our next guest transformed her kitchen for under get this 100 bucks. And we are happy to have with us right now Jeanette Lockmiller Stretch, the founder of the blog Snazzy Little Things. Jeanette, thank you so much for talking with us this morning. Thanks, Clyde. Happy to be here. Good, good. So you got a lot of great things going on uh, on your blog, but today we're going to talk about your kitchen in particular. So give us a quick run through of your renovation. Well, renovation is kind of a loose term. Actually, it was just paint. Uh, when we moved in, uh, we took a look at this house and we understood the market and the fair market value of the houses in the area. And we really couldn't sustain a $60,000 upgrade, so we actually transformed it just with paint. Oh, that Something looks that so you nice. can pick up at, at the craft store or at actually any of the hardware stores in the area. So um, about four days, four evenings worth of work is all it took to transform this particular space. And it was under $100. Well, okay, so that's the magic point for a lot of people who are looking at your kitchen. It is absolutely gorgeous. So, so how did you, what was the strategy that allowed you to pull off that renovation for under 100 bucks? Well, I've done this before. And uh, in the previous house, we had the deep grain oak cabinet. Um, so there's a few extra steps with that, um, but we had smooth cherry that was a little mismatched cherry in this particular house. Um, it's a little stripy. We always noticed the cherry cabinets weren't exactly matched up the wood that was used. So we thought a very nice clean aesthetic would be good. The first thing that we actually did was a light sanding on the cabinets, on the cabinet facings. After that, we applied a really light coat of primer um, and then at that point, we just applied two coats of uh, enamel paints and used a craft brush, which I can show you what that looks like. But the craft brushes are actually found in the craft store and they leave no brush marks. So you can see mine's been used quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> hey, well, let me let me dive in right so, quick. Um, let, let me ask you a question right quick, because the conventional wisdom suggests that you not paint cabinets because it hurts resale value. Is that true from your perspective? In our experience, it was the exact opposite. So when we put our house on the market in northern Ohio, we lived in a development where all the kitchens looked identical. And the realtor told us that our kitchen is what made our property stand out. Mm. That was the black and white kitchen that you saw before. 
So if nothing else, it generated foot traffic that was curious, and we ended up getting um, an above market value offer on the house. So I really do think, and according to our realtor, it increased the value of our home. Okay, so people are going to be real eager now to find out more of your insights and tips. How can they uh, get in touch with you on your blog? Uh, all they have to do is visit snazzylittlethings.com and there is a contact button and I'm happy to answer any questions they might have. What paints I use are going to be on the blog later today. All right, Jeanette, thank you so much for spending the time with us and letting us in your home as well. We appreciate it. Mona? Transplant patients need extraordinary options and exceptional care, and they need it nearby, not hours away. And that's why the professionals at UC Health are committed to delivering renowned treatments. We spoke to a doctor and a nurse about how they're helping people in need of liver and other transplants. Take a look. No one wants to hear that they need a liver transplant, but if you live in Cincinnati or you live in the greater Cincinnati area, it's okay. We understand the critical need for patients to have access to a transplant center. They are lifetime patients and we're going to see them uh, as long as their liver or their organ survives. Our patients here at UC Health, they're more likely to be transplanted and less likely to die compared to the rest of the region and the rest of the country. We have a program for liver cancer, bile duct cancer, even to transplant patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. We could take that liver out full of tumor and replace it with a new liver and potentially cure you of colorectal cancer. We're really excited about this innovation that we're able to offer our patients and it's a cold perfusion trial for liver transplantation. 2,500 people in this country die every year waiting for a liver transplant and if we can increase the donor pool, which we are with this perfusion pump, uh, we're going to save more lives. And we've rolled more patients in this study and done more livers with this cold perfusion pump than any other center in the country. It's innovative in that we've been using the same storage and pre uh, preservation techniques for a long time. So this is new. We're excited about it and uh, we're seeing great outcomes. When we first started doing liver transplant, the way that we do it is we go to the donor hospital, we, the team recovers the organ, they preserve it and they put it on ice and they take that liver that's put it on ice in a cooler and then we do the liver transplant. But with the cold perfusion pump, we take the liver, we put it on ice, but now we hook it up to this cold perfusion pump. And what this pump does is it circulates preservation solution through the liver and does a couple different things. The blood vessels in the liver really constrict down. When we hook it up to the perfusion pump, these blood vessels relax. So that means more preservation solution to the liver and more blood flow to the liver once we put it back inside the body. Another thing that happens is that even though the liver's cold, the liver cells are still alive and they're still active. If it's just sitting in a cooler, these liver cells are just using energy and it's just getting depleted. But the liver pump actually helps restore energy to the liver. It's going to get more blood flow, it has more energy, so it's really going to mean better outcomes for our patients right after transplant and in the long term. We're seeing uh, less complications, we're seeing shorter hospitalizations. So what this means for patient care is that it's improved. Patients are getting on the road to recovery much sooner. If we're worried about a liver not being usable for transplant, we can take it, we can put it on the pump, we can assess it, and if it's good to go, then we put it in the patient and we can use it. So at the end of the day, using this technology really is going to allow us to utilize more livers that might otherwise be discarded and transplant more patients and have better outcomes for our patients in the end. If you want to find out more about liver or other transplants, give UC Health a call at 513 584-9999 or just go online to uchealth.com slash transplant. Allie? Well, you may have read about it in history books or seen it in movies. It's a sport for the kings and it's over 4,000 years old. It's not chess or checkers, it's falconry. Yes, so we have a lot of lovely guests in the studio today. That includes Adam McGuire and Doug and Becky Geiger, falconers and educators with Miami Valley Falconry. Guys, thank you for being here. Hey, thank you for having us out. And the birds. Yeah. So right out the gate, who are our friends here? Okay, so this is Sabrina, the North American Barn Owl. She's a little over nine weeks old and she is new to the program. Doug here is holding the Saker Falcon known as Sherlock. And Becky over here, she's holding Poppy, the Harris Hawk. I love it. Okay, for viewers who don't know what falconry is, what is falconry? So falconry is the art of taking a bird from the wild and teaching it to tolerate us in the hunt and if successful, sharing its bounty. Mm -hmm. 
So what is your day to day like when you're training and working with these birds? It's a lot of flying back and forth. It's a lot of socialization and teaching trust and respect. And then we also have a lot of chores to do as well. It's yeah. not all yeah. just glamorous moments like this. We have a lot of hawk poop to clean as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and what is building that relationship like with the bird? Because you're, you're bonding. You're bonding, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're spending a lot of time with it. The first thing you do with the bird is you sit for mm -hmm. hours on end just staring at it and getting the bird used to your presence. You can do this with a completely full-grown wild bird and within 14 days you can have it hunting with you yeah. if you know what you're doing. I can do it in 14 days. I can teach you how to do that. Take me about 10 years to teach you how to do it. <laughs> yeah, and you, you were saying you've been doing it for 50 years, right? Just about 50 years. Tell a little bit about your background and why you got involved, all the, of you. The only reason I got involved is I was, I was hunting with a gun and I lost the desire to do so and I wanted yeah. to spend a lot of time in the woods and I've always thought these things were absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So consequently, I started falconry and it, you know, 50 year odyssey and at this point, we're, we're all interested in education. We want everybody else to get a taste of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why we started this, this whole program. Yeah, what do you want people to know about falconry and, and working with these birds? Um, so we, we do big talks on conservation and we educate the people on how they can be more environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. So like this bird right here, the barn owl, the number one killer is poisons. So our big talk with uh, when we do these is saying like, hey, how about you don't leave, use the poisons, leave those on the shelves? Because if you look out one day, you might see one of these in your backyard yeah. scooping up all the mice. And these guys do a lot better population control than what we ever can with poison. Yeah. Just like all these birds. The, the natural predators are gonna do much better than what we can. That's what they're there for, it's what they're designed for. And one of the things I'd like to say while we're on this subject is yeah. all these birds are born in captivity. Mm -hmm. This is all done by the falconry community. We're now growing all these things, and particularly this owl, was brought into captivity, born in captivity, specifically to do exactly what we're doing here. What you're doing, mm -hmm. educate yep. the public, educate which is the very, public. which is very important. Let them have a view. Yeah, and, and how many different species of birds are you working with? We got uh, Harris hawks, oh, goshawks, hawks, uh, yeah. prairie falcons. We've got uh, this lantern is sacred. falcon. Two Sacred lantern Falcon. falcons. Not the football team. Just Eurasian eagle. Yeah. <laughs> you just got a Eurasian eagle out. It's this big. <laughs> That's fantastic. And education is such a big part. Um, how can folks find more information about what you guys are doing, or if they want to learn more through classes, etc.? So we do have a website. It's www.miamivalleyfalconry.com. We have a Facebook and an Instagram. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you Thanks for having for us having out. Us. Thanks. Our technical director wants you to know the bird is the word. Coming up here on Cincy Lifestyle, we take a closer look at an unusual job, a taxidermist. We'll talk to one of the people in charge of creating scenes and preserving wildlife at Cincinnati Museum Center. All that and a whole lot more in just a few minutes. Hey, welcome back. When you see animals on display at the Cincinnati Museum Center, have you ever asked yourself, I wonder who did that? Well, we had the same question, so we went behind the scenes to see what the museum's taxidermist does. Take a look. From the word go, I was always interested in nature and fascinated with nature and animals in particular, and I just loved watching them. and. Uh, my dad was a hunter and took me out hunting and we would get uh, ducks, pheasants, rabbits, things like that. And I just wanted to preserve them for their beauty and the texture, that love the fur, the feathers, the colors, the textures. And so I just learned taxidermy in order to, to preserve these things and try to bring them back to life or just kind of give them life again. And um, to mount up, say, a bobcat like that, it probably would be um, five to six hours of work. Um, to do it right um, and then of course depending on the base like this base was homemade if you had created base with habitat that adds more time onto it taxidermy or preservation of, of animals for display purposes exhibit purposes your kind of your your main goals are accuracy aesthetics and just the quality that to make it look as alive as possible um, with preservation for research purposes your uh, major concerns are data about the animal. There's a lot, there's a, uh, a big program here to do study skins of birds, where birds are preserved, uh, that are, are road kills, hit windows, 
things like that that people bring in or people find. It's important to get all the information and data about that animal, where it was found, when the bird is skinned, um, where the animal uh, measurements are taken, tissue samples are taken, uh, weights are taken. There's a lot of things that are, are recorded about that animal before it is actually preserved. And then it is preserved in such a way that it saves space so that you can put a num large number of these specimens uh, in a drawer on a tray and slide it because there's hundreds if not thousands of specimens that need to be kept and information is all put on a tag and then kept with the specimen. So you don't want it to necessarily look lifelike but you want it to um, the information about it and in the future if they want tissue samples, feather samples, measurements off, the, off certain parts of the body they'll be preserved for that. I've always viewed it as kind of a preservation of the beauty of animals in a artistic way and in a flattering way. Uh, I will not do mounts of squirrels playing golf or frogs playing cards and things like that. I like to, I like to think that I'm maintaining respect for the animal and to show off its, its, its beauty. And um, I, I like, and one reason I kind of want to do it for museums is because it really has a purpose to, for education and um, uh, preservation of the species uh, in, in the natural world. So people will appreciate them. And if people can't see them in zoos or out in nature, uh, they can at least see a, a mounted example of it and appreciate it. Well, it seems like these days stars are made every day, especially on the internet, especially maybe YouTube. And my next guest is no exception. I am here with Emmy Sunshine, the 14-year-old singer, songwriter, whose first post of music garnered two million views. Oh my goodness, Emmy, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. All right, so describe your music. Well, that's uh, that's one thing that I've been trying to do for a very long time. I mean, I, I've been influenced by so many different people musically, and I think that's just kind of shaped me as an artist now. I mean, I sing a lot of bluegrass, I sing country, I sing Americana, I sing a little bit of everything, and that's just who I am. It is, and you sing, You mentioned you sing country. You sang at the Grand Old Opry. Oh, yeah. my goodness. How was that? That was a lot of fun. I mean, the first time we played there, it was nerve-wracking. And when you first walk out on that stage, I mean, that circle is very intimidating. And, you know, just being there is intimidating. But uh, after you've done it a few more times, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm sure it is. So people may be thinking that you're so young, so you're still in school. Yeah, How do you I'm manage that? Yeah, I've been homeschooled ever since kindergarten, so it makes it a lot easier for me to uh, get to do the things that I want to do, you know, get to play music and write and sing and also get a great education. Oh, that, that works. That's right. And I know your, your mom's proud. She's here with us today in the studio. Um, you're gonna, you write your own music, and you're going to be singing in just a few minutes for us, but tell us where people can see you in our community. Absolutely. Um, go to TheEmmySunshine.com. That is where you can find a lot of things you need to know about me, information about where we're going to be playing next, and also, you know, just further tour dates and everything like that, and merchandise, and, you know, just how I got my start. Wow, you have your own merchandise. Yeah. You go, girl. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So we are going to let you sing and let everybody hear Emmy Sunshine. Thank you.
All right, quick look outside right now. A little cloudy now, but there's a rumor there might be a little sunshine. Blue sky today, maybe we'll see. Coming up tomorrow here on Cincy Lifestyle, did you know that Doc Adams on Gunsmoke was based off a Cincinnati doctor? That's right. We'll talk about the real doctor who inspired the character and the importance of his campaign against the common house fly, all part of a new Cincinnati curiosity. That sounds great, Clyde. I can't wait for that. And that's Cincy Lifestyle for Wednesday, April 1st. Hey, reach out to us. We want to hear all of your ideas and what you're doing to stay sane while you're staying home. Thank you for watching. We will be here tomorrow. And in the meantime, make it a great day. Hey, thank you so much for watching our video. Now, if you like what you saw, hit the subscribe button. You can also check out full episodes of the show you've never seen before or watch your favorites again and again. And as always, be sure to make it a great day.